Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session of the Harvard Medical School Organizational Ethics Consortium. I'm Kelsey Berry. I'm one of the co-chairs of the consortium, along with Charlotte Harrison and Jim Sabin. And today I have the honor to be your moderator as we hear from three experts on the ethics of pursuing racially concordant care as an organizational strategy to reduce health disparities. So first, a quick note about this series. We are in our first consortium of 2021. So we first have to welcome everyone to this bright new year. Uh, this consortium is now in its seventh year hosted by Harvard Center for Bioethics. And it really aims to build a learning community of practitioners and scholars around the topic of organizational ethics in healthcare. So our programs this season to date have examined the role and responsibilities of various health system players in laying a foundation for health and flourishing in our communities, as well as the very challenging work of building equity directly into organizational practice with, as always, a constant eye to the ethical questions that frame these issues. How do we analyze, advocate for, act upon, and ultimately hold ourselves accountable for our value-based commitments? Particularly when there is often legitimate disagreement over values. And how do we make good on our value-based commitments within the organizational reality of limited resources, systemic constraints, and uncertainty? We hope that you'll all consider yourselves a part of this dialogue and community and join us again for upcoming programs, which I'll describe towards the end of the session today. But back to today, uh, racial disparities in care are one of the most pressing and persistent injustices of our time, prompting many healthcare organizations to ask what they can do in their own house that will yield substantive health gains for Black patients in particular. But how should managers translate an evidence base into organizational action on health disparities? As we turn to that issue, we'll be guided by three experts in management, ethics, and history to the evidence for racially concordant care, and then together scope out the moral and ethical terrain that shapes the actions a manager might take in response. So a word to the audience about your own participation in today's program. There are two major opportunities to participate today. So one, you can submit questions for our panelists at any time using the Q&A feature. Selected questions will be discussed at the end of the discussion today. And then second, we'll have a fairly robust discussion partway through the program today. And during that case discussion portion, you can use the chat box to share your thoughts, or we particularly encourage you to use the hand raise function to signal that you'd like to speak. And then you'll be called upon to unmute yourself and you can share your comment and thoughts verbally. If you run into technical difficulties or questions about that, just shoot a note in the chat box and our staff and we will make sure that you have the opportunity to participate. So I have the privilege now of introducing our panelists. Uh, we first welcome Osaze Udabala. Osaze is a fourth year medical student at NYU. He is a thinker, an engineer and physician in training whose work lies at the intersection of healthcare management and innovation. A graduate of Cooper Union, and MIT Sloan School. Osaze's professional background includes management consulting, early stage drug discovery, business development, and venture capital. We also welcome Lauren Taylor. Lauren is a postdoctoral fellow at NYU Grossman School of Medicine in their Department of Population Health. Lauren's current work explores the ethical challenges associated with managing healthcare organizations and markets. Her research has been published in academic journals such as Health Affairs, Hastings Center Report, and Kennedy Institute of Ethics Journal, as well as news outlets such as the New York Times and the New Yorker. She trained as an oncology chaplain at Massachusetts General Hospital and in the Office of Ethics at Boston Children's Hospital. 
And finally, we're welcoming Adam Biggs. Adam is an instructor in African American studies and US history at the University of South Carolina, Lancaster. And he also recently defended his PhD dissertation in American studies here at Harvard. His research explores the roles that black doctors played in the desegregation of Harlem Hospital and examines their efforts to use professional medicine as a tool to advocate for racial improvement in the first half of the 20th century. We're so thrilled to have the three of you with us. So with that, I will turn it over to Lauren and Osaze to get us started. Thanks so much, Kelsey. It's fun to be back at the Organizational Ethics Consortium. Um, and I'm thrilled with this turnout, I have to say, because I'm just gonna share my screen here. Oh, yeah, I really shared my screen. Hmm. Poor Ashley just walked us through this. Um, I'm so, well, let me reshare so that you don't have to see all of my emails pop up. Uh, I was just gonna say, I'm so thrilled to see the folks who are joining. I just took a quick scroll through the participant list and my goodness, um, we certainly have experts uh, on the line. So I really hope um, our goal today is to make this as interactive as humanly possible in spite of it being over Zoom. And um, so I really do hope that you'll kind of use your voice, use the chat box, and chime in because this is not designed to be a lecture. Um, it's meant to be kind of a cooperative endeavor where we explore the complexity of this question. And um, that takes kind of a little bit of effort on everybody's part. So we've tried to think hard about how to set the stage, but we really, really do invite you um, to please speak up, raise your hand, use the chat box and engage with us um, whenever and wherever you can. So my goal here is just to kind of set the stage a little bit. Um, as Kelsey previewed, uh, the way that I thought we would use our time together is I'm not going to do an in-depth literature review of um, what we know about the research on racial concordance. That would take certainly the full 90 minutes, if not more. Instead, I'm going to try and give you a taste of that literature. So spotlight three fairly recent papers, just in case you're coming to this with an interest in racial disparities or health equity, but you might come and have no idea what literature we're talking about. So I'm gonna try and set the stage. Then um, as Kelsey previewed, we're gonna set up a case and both Osaze and I were trained at business schools. So this is kind of a um, common pedagogical tool there where we'll outline kind of the contours of a dilemma. And this is where we're really gonna be looking to you to jump in and participate. Tell us how you would see the case, what you think you would do. That's gonna last about 20 minutes. Then we're gonna invite Adam, who is our true expert on the panel um, into the conversation. He's gonna bring this fabulous historical perspective that I think frankly is often missing from the bioethics discussion. And we really want to um, kind of learn from him. And then we will kind of towards the end have an open forum Q and A where uh, we won't try and pin you into the case study parameters quite so much. Instead, we can let that conversation drift um, and kind of travel where it will. So that's a rough outline of how we'll use the time. Um, as for this literature, I said, I'm just gonna give you a taste. So this is the paper that first sparked certainly my attention um, to this question of like, ooh, okay, what are the implications? It was a paper published in the Proceedings of National Academy of Science. So incredibly prestigious, high-flying journal. It just came out in 2020 in the spring. And the question that the researchers asked was as follows, does physician-patient racial concordance improve infant mortality out outcomes? This was a retrospective analysis. I, again, I don't wanna go too deep into the specific methodologies and design, but it is worth noting it was retrospective rather than um, kind of a randomized control trial that would be prospective. They considered the assignment of physicians to uh, infants or newborns to be quasi-random, very big data set. And here's kind of top line findings. Findings were that newborn physician racial concordance, meaning when you had a black baby born to a physician who was themselves black, that was associated with a significant mortality improvement for those black infants. There did not seem to be a significant, statistically significant improvement in kind of the mother's health or the mother's outcomes. Um, and the authors note that 
the benefits here were especially uh, kind of observable when you had what they considered to be complicated births in hospitals. So they were able to look at a little bit of information about the type of admission and the types of things that had gone on in the hospital and where the case was more complicated, the concordance between the race of the baby and the race of the physician seemed more salient. I should also just note, there may be people on the line who are actually authors on some of these studies. And if you are an author on one of them, I especially invite you to speak up um, in the chat or when we're doing the Q&A, we would love to hear any additional kind of caveats or nuance you wanna add here. But that's a snapshot of this Greenwood paper. It received a tremendous amount of crash. CBS News picked it up, CNN picked it up. Um, and the kind of headline that people took from this was that when black babies in particular have black physicians, they do better, period. Um, and so this was used to kind of motivate a discussion just like the one we're having here about both uh, the diversity of the physician workforce, but also I think as we'll get to today, maybe some more difficult questions about, well, in the short term, uh, when we've not yet solved the pipeline issue, what do we make of this research finding and what should we do with it? A second, um, just again, taste of a paper was this kind of Aslan paper. It's only about two years old. I guess now we're in 2021, so three. This was an MBER working paper, but incredibly rigorous methods. And here the question was again about racial concordance, but a different patient population. So here the question was, do black male patients, apologies, this should be capitalized, um, randomized to black male doctors actually wind up uh, following through, asking for and taking up additional preventive care. This was out of Oakland. Here you actually did have a randomized control trial design. So that makes it different and some would say a stronger design from the previous paper we talked about. It was based in Oakland, California. Um, and the big kind of outcome measure here, again, was uptake in preventive services. The key finding was that black males who were matched with black physicians were more likely to select preventative services after a consultation with a black physician. And so the big kind of, when they modeled this out and they said, okay, well, uh, what could this do on a population basis? The takeaway was that black doctors could reduce black, white, male gap in cardiovascular mortality by something on the order of 19%. So you get these like huge implications when you take the study findings and you kind of uh, blow them out to a population basis. And then finally, just one, one other taste. This is the paper by Andrew Hill and colleagues again from 2018. Um, and the question here was, so now in a hospital setting, so this inpatient, whereas the previous study I just showed you was outpatient, does doctor patient race match impact patient mortality? This was not an RCT, it was a retrospective analysis using, I believe, the same data set from Florida as the first study. And the key finding was that the kind of racial concordance here substantially reduced the likelihood of in-hospital mortality on the order of 15%. So another like pretty eye-popping finding in my mind. And um, here, as in other cases, the findings were driven by black physician patient race matching. So I just wanted to, again, give you a taste and we could go deep, deep into a methodological analysis, but I just wanted to give you a sense for what are we talking about when we even raise the question, like what are the implications of this literature? Um, these are the kinds of studies that populate this literature. And I would just say on the whole, I think there's an informal count if if my nosing around is right, of somewhere in the order of 15 to 20 papers that take up similar kinds of questions about the benefits or the potential benefits of racial concordance. They take up that question in different parts of the health system, inpatient, outpatient, community settings, clinical settings, um, and they take it up with a fairly vast array of patient populations. So you saw infants, delivering moms, African-American men, um, you know, you can slice and dice the population in a bunch of different ways and ask a lot of different questions. And there's not uniformity on that front at all. Um, but the emphasis is when you think about racial concordance, we could of course be thinking about any race of people, but the emphasis on this literature is on black patients. There's a range of outcomes studied. So some think about um, behavioral stuff like the second study where they're asking about uptake of preventative services. 
and others are really focused on outcome outcomes like mortality. And that's not standard, but both have been looked at. And the methodologies are variable. So most are retrospective. A handful use prospective randomization, but I just want to note that. Um, and then the effect sizes, of course, are also variable. Some are quite substantial. And I would say just in the kind of uh, name of transparency, there are some findings that show no effect, that it doesn't matter what the racial concordance is between a physician and patient. Um, it doesn't seem to matter. Black patients do just as well with white or other race doctors as they do with black doctors. But I haven't yet seen a paper that shows any kind of harm. And I think that's important as we move into the case study just to keep in mind. So bottom line here, um, I would say, I think this literature is like far from ironclad in the sense that there's a little bit of a scattershot quality to it. But generally, if you kind of squint and just say, okay, holistically, what should we take from it? It does appear um, that racially concordant care for black patients appears to be beneficial. There's lots of things that we can and will, I hope, explore about why that might be. There might be some publication bias. There might be other things that are driving these effects. Um, wet your palate before we move into the case study, which we're going to do right now. So I'm going to hand it over to Asase. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, just as a quick backdrop, um, you know, Lauren and I have been have been thought partners in preparing for the symposium. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, to be working together and also to, um, you know, benefit from, from Adam's expert historical counsel. Um, you know, as Kelsey mentioned, as Lauren also alluded to, um, and as I passionately believe, this is um, a very timely topic. So I'm glad that um, all of you who are, who are attending are here and able to, uh, to participate in the discussion. I hope it's, it's um, helpful um, and at least, you know, thought provoking. So um, if you wouldn't mind, Lauren, uh, starting yeah. with the first part. Um, so here is, here is a case set up. Um, please put yourself in Dr. Pollock's seat and, um, you know, think, please, you know, as, as we, as we, as I continue to, to give information, um, just think about how you feel. Um, and when we, when we ask you a question, there's going to be a poll at the end. Um, don't think too much about, about your, your reaction. Uh, we really want to get your sort of like, uh, knee jerk uh, gut reaction first, and then we'll have a little bit of a discussion about, you know, where that knee-jerk reaction comes from. Okay, so um, this is Dr. Pollock. Um, she is the Chief Medical Officer of Just Healthcare, a delivery organization that holds uh, financial risk um, for 200,000 plus patients. She's very committed to using organizational policy to pursue health equity. So, um, Dr. Pollock has reviewed um, the literature, the literature that we just discussed, and you know many other, um, you know, studies that have been, that have uh, taken place on racial concordance and its uh, benefits or or uh, risks, and is considering roll, rolling out a new program to try and match uh, the organization's black physicians to black patients more deliberately. Um, a few points to to elaborate here. Number one, the program would rely on racial self identification. Um, number two, the program would be opt-in for both patients and physicians, uh, so there's no coercion here. Um, and number three, the program would begin in an outpatient setting. Um, so, so with all of this in mind, um, also Dr. Pollock rec recognizes that Black patients have commonly sought out um, in the past racially concordant care through informal referral networks um, in hopes that a program like this would lessen the required lead legwork for uh, those patients who opt in. Um, Dr. Pollock also believes that the literature is strongest with respect to Black patient outcomes and uh, the moral urgency to improve Black-white disparities in healthcare in particular justifies an initial focus on this uh, patient population. So with that said, um, thank you for opening up the poll, uh, Ashley. The question is, if you were Dr. Pollock, uh, would you support the implementation of a race-based race -based physician patient matching system? Um, it, like I was mentioning, you know, whatever your knee-jerk reaction is, please, please enter it now. Um, we'll have people not necessarily defend, but just sort of elaborate, you know, the different dimensions along which um, this type of consideration might take place. 
Super. And let's give, yeah, we'll give it another maybe 30 seconds or so for folks mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. give us a reaction. And then, oh, this is so interesting. Are you able to see this, Osaze? As yeah, I'm, I'm looking at it too. That is very interesting. You. Yeah, I know. Okay. I can't wait to share them back with you. <laughs> All right, people, uh, get your get your voices ready. Two more seconds. Great. All right, so you should be seeing the results now, and uh, I'm I'm frankly a little bit surprised and delighted. Uh, if you were Dr. Pollock, would you support the implementation? Yes. We got 82% of you to go in on yes. And no, we've got just under 20%, so 18%. First thing, Osaze, we're going to kind of co-moderate this, uh, folks. But Osaze, surprised? Uh, me personally, based on the, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I mean, it, let's let's definitely get some, some thoughts first. I, I think I was surprised, um, personally. personally. Um, we'll see how people feel at the end. Um, so. Uh, question number one, um, feel free to either, you know, raise your hand or uh, type something in the chat box. Um, you know, what were, what were, uh, you know, considerations that you had here? What were you trying to sort of uh, optimize? What were you most concerned about? I see Susan Par uh, Parker's hand up. So I'm going to allow you to talk, Susan, and uh, chime in, get us started here. I, as a clinical geneticist, do not know what that program would mean by race. I don't know what race is. It sounds to me like the program would be moving toward the Hopkins colored clinic from the years past that ended up with the Henrietta Lacks problem. And it sounds discriminatory. It worries me. And and it frightens me as a concept. I agree that if people whose skin is darker than some other people feel more comfortable being cared for by people whose skin is darker, then that would be a noble effort. But if people would feel that something would be wrong with the care that would be received because it would be somehow lesser quality, that scares me. So you could call it brown and black um, clinic, um, but that also has very negative flavor. And with the amount of what we're learning of black resistance to vaccination based on Tuskegee and all of the discrimination that's already gone on, I, I would think this could end up feeling um, highly discriminatory and worrisome. It would have to be extremely well managed and, and thought through for terminology. Great, thanks for getting us started, Susan. There was a lot there, and I'm going to just bring in a couple more voices um, to respond before either Osaze and I start start responding. So um, I see Bob Trug, Keisha Ray, and Tommy Ojo. So I'm going to go in that order. So um, Bob, you should be unmuted now. Uh, I'm assuming I'm un unmuted. It's uh, yeah, Bob Trug. Yeah, we can hear you. Um, so. It doesn't seem that complicated to me. It seems that people self-select uh, their uh, friends, their business partners, their doctors. I, you know, I, I, I don't know that I've ever really done this intentionally, but every uh, primary care physician I've had has been male and roughly about my same age. Um, so uh, what's driving this seems to be ubiquitous and to make it a little bit more simple. I mean, you, you said that they're, they're self-identified. It's not that we're assigning people to particular races uh, that, that uh, um, in a uh, way that would um, be discriminatory. I mean, these are, these are how people have self-identified and it seems to just be facilitating a process that goes on all the time. Great. Thanks so much, Bob. Uh, I'm gonna go to Tony next. Hi, um, so I'm Tommy. I'm, also, I'm a fourth year. Tommy, sorry. 
No, that's okay. Um, fourth year med student, um, also at the HKS, um, getting my MPP. And this is really interesting to me because I think a lot about um, black women whom I hear um, wanting to have a black OBGYN given everything we hear about uh, racial disparities and maternal mortality. And so in my mind, when I read this, I thought, wow, it would be awesome that health systems have a way to make this easier for them to do. Um, I think similar to what was just being said is that we also already kind of naturally select this, but at times, but because there are less black physicians, it would actually be really helpful to give people a resource um, I think to make their care racially concordant if they want to. And if there are physicians as well who say, I don't, all of my patients don't necessarily need to have the same race as me, but if there are people who feel more comfortable because of who I am and my background and experiences potentially, why not make that um, available to patients and physicians? Thanks, Tommy. Keisha, uh, oh. Keisha, it looks like in order for me to allow you to talk because you're using an older version of Zoom, I have to promote you to panelist. So I'm going to check in with our um, tech folks. Ashley, could you give me a heads up on what the best thing to do uh, here? Looks like she's on? in. Oh, perfect. Is it okay? Yeah, fire away. Okay, sorry think. about that. Um, so really what I was basing this on is um, whenever I give presentations on racial disparities in health and black health, there's always there's always people in the audience who talk about how their life changed once they had a black physician. And I have my own personal story. My life changed when I finally got a black dermatologist after decades of, of mistreatment, basically. So when I looked at this, what I ultimately cared about were, were patient outcomes. Um, I think it's okay in this instance to use self-identifying information. We're not forcing it on people and saying you are strictly into these racial groups. It's self-identified. And sometimes even in these audiences, I'll see that there are, are white patients who prefer black caregivers for various reasons. Um, so I think it's really just, it gets really increasing these freedom of choices and allowing patients to seek out the best outcomes, just like we would for any person that wants a particular doctor for whatever reason. Thanks so much, Keisha. Everyone should know Keisha is a, a bioethicist in her own right and a real expert on this as well. So um, we're grateful to have you here, Keisha. Uh, Beverly, I see your name next. So I'm gonna hit allow to talk and why don't you chime in? Oh, for one moment uh, before, oh. before uh, Dr. Wilson chimes in, I was hoping that you know after uh, those comments, we could pop over to the chat because there have been, uh, you know, plenty of discourse in the chat and then and then stop to sort of uh, summarize some of what we've been hearing thematically. This is why there's two of us, so I say, perfect. Let's let um, <laughs> really chime in and then we'll go over to the chat. That's the right idea. Well, first of all, thank you both and all of you actually for putting forward this program is highly timely. Of course, healthcare outcomes, that's everyone's goal to get the best care to those who are seeking it. It bothers me only a little in terms of that people have to be selected out. However, the overall goal of getting people to be free to voice their concerns, having practiced medicine 30 years, persons reveal more when they feel more comfortable. When you identify with your caregiver, whatever that reason might be, be it race, socioeconomic status, where you live, where you're providing your business, whatever it is that they identify with, that level of comfort makes them more likely to give more information to you provide better care. So simply making that available, I don't think it lessens the care that we're going to give. I hope that it won't be perceived as being discriminatory in a reverse manner because ultimately everyone's goal should be the same, improving health care for all persons. And of course, people who are brown, people who are black, people who are white, whatever their color, they're all part of the human race. So that's what we're here to promote. So this is just one more method of getting that accomplished. So hats off to everyone on the panel. Thanks, Beverly. Oh, sorry, do you Excellent. want to over the chat? Yeah, um, okay, let's see. Um, so uh, Lachlan Fora, uh, I hope that's uh, appropriate pronunciation, 
uh, says, uh, I voted no. I think it's possible to design systems that make it much easier for patients to choose clinicians based on their, uh, you know, quote unquote, matching, matching preferences um, that are not explicitly race-based. Um, so, so steering away from race-based, uh, you know, choice systems. Uh, Catherine Saylor says, uh, opt-in and self-designated racial category made me more willing to vote yes. Um, so uh, I'll come back to come back to that too because I'm hearing a lot of that. Uh, Dr. David Neil Sontag says, if uh, we have evidence that we could improve care for a particular population without detrimentally uh, affecting the care of others, why would we not use it? This is only self-reported, uh, or this is self-reported race identification. My only hesitation is that the uh, perpetuation that race matters, um, which it does given our uh, current situation, but arguably shouldn't. Um, which is a great point that we'll uh, also come back to. Um, Donald Padhoff says, uh, you know, very good point, well articulated uh, colorist question mark um, promotion as uh, as part of the framing the question issue. So again, this uh, this 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 uh, color piece is sort of um, re reinforcing race based differences. Um, so we're hearing a lot of that. Um, Miss Christine Mitchell says, I think the case that. Uh, what, what set up is uh, Dr. Pollock's preference, but um, but in my own view would be to leave more control about whether slash when slash how to race match should remain with the patient, maybe with a soft nudge through information. Um, so some grappling there with, uh, with patient autonomy, whether it's uh, explicit or sort of in implicit. Um, Nikki Tenderman says, uh, since both uh, physician and patient uh, would opt in, I wonder if the pro program would draw those or motivated slash interested in thinking about how racial, racial concordance impacts care. Um, it might end up with uh, self-selected patients and physicians who, uh, you know, care about quote unquote matching preferences. Um, so there, you know, uh, there's, there's something there to, to, to speak to um, selection um, and the, the consequences of selection, and how that might impact care as well. Um, Oh, Sanjay, I so, wanted to yeah. maybe take the um, prerogative just because I know both Lachlan Farrow, who is an ethicist, and Bob Trug, who is an ethicist, and I feel like I hear them saying slightly different things, and I wonder if either of them would chime in again. I feel like Bob said to us earlier, I don't see any problem here. You know, as you said, Lorna and Osaze, people do this naturally and informally. So we're just making something uh, more formal and maybe easier for people to navigate than it already is. But this kind of quest for racial concordance is already happening. So kind of shrug, what's the big deal? Maybe I'm overstating it, Bob, but a little bit of that. And then I heard Lachlan saying, oh, I would really like, I'm happy with people doing these things informally but I really don't like the idea of going to an explicitly race-based kind of matching or concordance system. And this is something that I think you and I have really grappled with is to some extent, we use the example of if you're a manager in an oncology clinic and you kind of hear that a bunch of your patients are seeking out Reiki care or whatever it is, right? As some kind of um, complementary therapy or what have you, then I think most people think good management is saying, oh, well, if there's an evidence base for that, I should bring that forward as kind of an entitlement of being part of my patient practice. Like I should make that a formal um, thing that they can access so they don't have to do the legwork to go out and do it themselves. And I guess the question that I would just put back to both of you, Bob and Lachlan, is like, is this different? Is it different as a manager to formalize something around Kind of the quest for racial concordance than it is to formalize other kinds of services or um, yeah kind of amenities for a patient population and were either either of you maybe swayed by the other's concern or lack thereof. Lachlan I see your hand I'm going to unmute you here or allow you to talk. I guess I, I put in a bunch of other comments and um, uh, I don't know if Bob and I disagree, but often when we do, I think he's probably right. But um, uh, my, my highest level concern is that we need to do things that as urgently, quickly as possible, improve race-based disparities in care, but in ways that will bring us closer to where we really wanna be. Um, and my concern is that uh, uh, 
this can leap out to Dr. Um, Dr. Pollock as, oh, now I fixed something. And now I've contributed to a culture where black, black concordance in patient provider is like, that's a good thing. And then when it's not happening, we worry, oh, maybe it should be happening more. And then we've deepened the uh, race-based identities that are part of the disease we're trying to cure. Um, uh, and as I said in the um, chat, my last uh, comment is, I think the single most important step that Dr. Pollock needs to take, and all of us do, is to not think we're so smart, we've got scientific literature, we're going to fix the problem for these other people, but to invite the people who are uh, experiencing disparities as partners and figure out what's most helpful. They'll have lots of other ideas. Um, they aren't specific to Black patients, and I think things may grow from that. And it might be that you come out of designing that, that um, uh, from them, they want to have the ability to specifically match by their identified race, um, not just for Black patients, but Latinx and others. Um, but in that conversation that's deeper, we'll be learning about the pros and cons, including the uh, 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 Spanish speaking providers in our uh, primary care practice who have disproportionate numbers of Latinx patients. Um, and that not only means that they have fewer of lots of other patients that they actually would like to take care of, um, but they also know their colleagues are not learning about Latinx culture and all of those things. Um, and it is not getting us close to where we wanna go. So, you know, as people who know me know obsessively, I think there's a both and, and, and path here that we have grossly oversimplified by saying, oh, we got this data, now we're gonna match by race, uh, kumbaya. Thanks, Lachlan. Bob, do you wanna chime in briefly? And then I'm gonna turn it over to Adam to, uh, to join the conversation next. Sure, just really briefly, I think there's a tension here between um, us always saying that race doesn't matter, we don't wanna reify race, we're removing race from all these metrics in, in medicine. Um, there's a tension between that and the reality that race does matter as shown in the evidence that you presented at the beginning. Um, and uh, uh, you know, to the extent that uh, we already permit people to choose their providers in so many ways, why would we say that race is the is the one thing that we're going to exclude? I mean, it seems to be sort of saying, oh, you know, all these other things can matter, but but you can't let race matter, and that that just seems illogical to me. Yeah, great, thanks, Bob. Uh, Osaze, any last comments on what we've heard so far before I turn it over to Adam? Um, you know, in the interest of time, let's uh, let's let's definitely turn it over to Adam. There's a there's plenty more um, that's super valuable in the in the in the chat. Um, but yeah, let's give some space for, for Adam to react. Great. Adam, tell us what you think based on what you heard and well, all that you know. I just I just want to say, you know, I really appreciate you guys setting this up and I love the richness of this conversation. And I, you know, this is really it's fascinating to me in a lot of different ways, thinking about this from a historical perspective. And I guess one of the things that I have to ask is that when we see numbers that high, 82% of people sort of in favor of this, are we sort of underestimating the role that white supremacy still sort of maintains within our patient population? Because I, I, and I'm, when I'm hearing this conversation, you know, I mean, I'm sitting in Lancaster, South Carolina, and I, I realize a lot of folks here are, you know, in, um, in Cambridge. And I, I can tell you those are two very different places. Um, and also, you know, who's in this room is actually sort of a very different sort of um, group of people. And I, you know, I think we may very well like feel like there are more folks who have certain levels of, of racial enlightenment, if we want to call it that, who kind of, um, you know, challenge whether or not race is actually a meaningful kind of intervention. I wonder if that doesn't put black doctors out of business, right? Like if you say that we are going to um, match in that particular type of way, do you allow white patients to make those same decisions? And if you do, are you effectively limiting what kind of opportunities black practitioners have um, to practice medicine? And, and um, um, Lachlan sort of mentioned this, I think is what he was kind of getting at here. Uh, I think it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a very kind of interesting kind of um, dilemma to actually sort of to, to, to raise with this. Um, I wonder if we were talking about surgery, if people would feel about it the same way. You know, when we're talking about general practitioners, 
um, when people are you know, dealing with chronic diseases or coughs and headaches and um, that sort of thing, if, if we are more comfortable with the idea of assigning black doctors into these roles, would we allow patients um, who needed surgery, thoracic surgery or, or other sort of complicated procedures where there are disproportionate numbers of black patients in those positions, but also um, those are things that surgeons and residents sort of compete for is the opportunity to get these types of um, procedures. What kind of tensions, sort of class tensions within medicine would sort of present themselves there? Um, when I think about this historically, I think part of this is, is interesting because when we talk about, I mean, my work looks at the desegregation of Harlem Hospital in the early part of the 20th century. And so um, one of the things that happens here, this happens in the 19, starts in 1919 and ends in 1935. And in the wake of World War I, one of the things that happens is that with a, the, the influx of uh, African Americans into Harlem, there is a push to bring more Black practitioners onto Harlem Hospital staff, right? Black communities are getting a larger voice in Harlem because their numbers are growing. And there is a push for really about a 10-year period to integrate the Harlem Hospital staff. Um, this is an epic battle that kind of takes place within Harlem and within the medical community um, in Harlem between Black practitioners and white practitioners on staff over how to integrate this process, how to integrate the institution, and who among um, Harlem's Black medical community should be sort of integrated and added into the, the institution. There is a major reorganization of the hospital governance system in 1930, one that brings a slew of Black practitioners onto, onto the staff and actually um, oust several of the white practitioners who had been there for a long time. This does not end the conflict. After this, that moment takes place, there is a conflict that emerges within the Black practitioners of Harlem about who should gain access to the staff, whether those who are um, trained at institutions like Harvard and UPenn, um, whether they should, uh, these elite institutions, and, and, and whether they should be given um, priority to serve at these institutions or whether practitioners from Meharry and Howard should be given priority to serve at these institutions. And it's very much a question about what type of institution Harlem Hospital is going to become. Is it going to become a cutting edge research institution or is it going to become a, an integrated cutting edge research institution? Because there are a lot of black patients who come in with um, that need surgical kind of interventions. There are a lot of different types of types of medical research that can be done at Harlem because of the population they're serving? Or is it going to become an institution that, that is dedicated to the training of Black medical personnel? This sort of goes on until a riot breaks out and sort of in, in 1935 and the discussion about you know, who gets into this hospital changes. But what also sort of changes is the perception that patients in Harlem have about the hospital itself. Once it becomes a Black institution, Patients aren't as enthusiastic about going there. And a lot of them, when they have the opportunity, they will go to, in the, to other institutions in, Nor in New York to get medical care. This is sort of a condition that runs throughout the better part of the 20th century, right? I think it was 1967 when um, Martin Luther King is stabbed in Harlem, right? And they are looking for a place to, um, to treat his injury, to treat his wounds. And there is a debate because he's in Harlem and they take him to Harlem Hospital, but before they actually treat him, there is an ongoing, I mean, it, it, a, a rather vigorous debate about whether or not they should treat him at the Black Hospital. And it takes the, the chief of surgery, um, Aubrey Menard, he has to go and convince the King's entourage um, and the mayor and other uh, local political leaders who are there sort of debating this about he has to convince them that, Har that the doctors at Harlem Hospital can actually care adequately for King, right? They, 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 they treat his wound, he comes out just fine. And at the end of this, one of King's entourage comes up to him and said, you know, I thought Aubrey Menard was, uh, was a fancy white doctor, okay? I think we want to be careful and I, and, and, I, and I think that, they're, they're, that the, the results of the studies that, that, um, that Lauren shared, I think they are meaningful. And I think they, they tell us some things that we do wanna be conscientious about and considerate about. 
But I, I think we also don't want to overestimate the extent to which black, black patients actually want black practitioners. And part of that, I'm going to share my screen with you. This is a quote from the autobiography of Damon Tweedy. Some of you may be familiar with this already. Um, some maybe not. And let's see. Here we go. Is that coming through, guys? Okay. Things are kind of moving strangely. Here. We could see your screen. It was just end of slideshow. So I think if you just go okay. kind of click on the slide and reshare, it'll be good to go. Sorry. How no worries. Is that up now? Nope. Not nope. yet. There, there we, we go. Perfect. Okay. All right. So Damon Tweedy, who is um, a practitioner at uh, Duke now, right? This is from his autobiography in 2015. And he is not the only Black practitioner who mentions moments like this, okay? Um, uh, ben Carson mentions this in his autobiography and several of the autobiographies of Black physicians that I've read. I mean, almost to a person mention incidents like this. But he was treating a patient um, who had sickle cell anemia. And when he came in, this is the reaction that the patient had for him. I'm going to read it out to you um, to just give you a sense of some of what his encounter was, right? He says, come on, man. We both know what the deal here is. I'm sure you did good in school and everything, but they're passing you off on me. And they think I won't care because I'm supposed to be a dumb nigger. Go tell your boss I don't want no black doctor. I didn't come all the way to Duke to see no black doctor unless he's some kind of expert. I could have stayed home if I wanted to see a country ass doctor. I ain't gonna be no guinea pig. And what I think, like I said, what he is articulating there is not in any way kind of unique. And the evidence I'm kind of bringing you, bringing to you with this is fairly anecdotal, but I think it makes the case, I mean, uh, that there is a range of attitudes that black communities hold toward black physicians. And I think um, when we talk about, you know, how we are going to, make these kind of decisions, I think this is something that, that we should, you know, consider and continue to sort of take into account. It's not clear to me that, I mean, these attitudes have disappeared in the last 20 years all of a sudden. I think it actually is kind of um, like absurd to kind of make that assertion. But if we want to sort of promote this idea, then I think it, it really does require almost sort of a granular level of, of sort of analysis and, and interpretation to, to, to think about how we can apply it. Um, and I, I'm wondering, should I just kind of stop right there for now and, and we can kind of... Thank you, Adam. Um, yes, we're... we're um, so I wanted to thank the three of you and all of those who um, shared in the chat box and also verbally for starting to scope out this moral terrain, which is clearly many varied. Um, and also for thinking about how we, the core question here is not just what managers could do, right? Mm. But what they ought to do, what kind of an institution do they want their institution to become as Adam um, forced us to think about. So um, for those who join late in the event, let me, and for everyone, let me encourage you to start sharing your questions using the Q and A function. Um, we're going to come to those a little bit later on. Uh, and before we do that though, I did wanna give, um, Lauren and Osaze and Adam a chance to uh, reflect on, on what they've shared so far and maybe ask a question of one another if they'd like to do that. You know, I'll just call out right now <clears throat> the, uh, the, the conversation that's going on in the chat uh, right now, I'm, I'm finding incredibly rich. Um, you know, we, we, before this, uh, this symposium started, we, we said that there was, a, there was a risk that we wouldn't be able to fit everything in within the 90 minutes. Um, clearly, that's, uh, that's, that's going to be the case. Um, there is discussion about internalized racism. There's discussion about, uh, you know, sort of backfiring. There's discussion about autonomy. Um, many, much of that is, uh, was captured in, in Adam's comments, uh, of course. Um, you know, I, I just, I think for, for all the attendees, if you have a chance to, to sort of peruse through how people have, uh, you know, 
looked at different angles of this question. Um, I, I think it's incredibly rich. So, so again, I'm very glad that we're able to have this discussion. We have, uh, you know, over a hundred people who are who are here and. <laughs> in attendance, so um, a, a wide variety of perspectives. I had a question for you um, based on your dissertation work. Um, and I wonder if you could share with the group, you know, a lot of your work is about the integration of Harlem Hospital, but then mm -hmm. if I'm remembering correctly, there was kind of a subsequent effort to say, we should now start kind of a black only hospital, like a segregated hospital yeah. again. Um, and can you, I only got as far as that was a live discussion. Um, and I wonder if you could just fill us in because in some ways I think one of the critiques that most stops me in my tracks when I, I start to think down this path of, oh yeah, maybe you could do a racial matching program and it would be opt-in on both sides is I've had some folks say to me, well, that's just ushering in a return of segregated medicine. And so you have kind of the background to kind of contextualize that for us. Um, where did that conversation go way back in the 1930s, 40s? Um, and did that segregated hospital actually come to fruition after these huge efforts to do the integration of Harlem Hospital? All right, good, because I think what you're highlighting is that how intrinsically um, conflicted like this discussion is. Like there is no real clear answer to this one way or the other, because at the same time that we see Harlem Hospital get integrated, there's also a call to say, well, maybe we can build a separate private um, black facility um, you know, in Harlem as well. And then that will perhaps remedy some of the conflicts that we see going on between the, the black practitioners there. I think you know, one of the things that maybe we need to kind of get comfortable with is, I mean, the way that actual moment worked out is that um, there was enough resistance to that idea it was the Julius Rosenwald Fund, which was a, um, you know, a wealthy philanthropic group that had a lot to do with, I mean, made a lot of substantive contributions to um, Black medical education and, and black, black medical schools. Um, they had sort of proposed the idea of building a separate Black hospital in Harlem. And um, the political environment at the time just didn't really a lot for it. Um, but I think what you're actually laying out there is that one of the things I think sometimes these conversations sort of want us to get toward is a place where we can say, all right, we'll get comfortable doing this one way or we'll get comfortable doing this another way. And I think one of the things that's sort of intrinsically embedded in this is the conflict and the, and the tension and the indecision. Like there is no right answer on how to do these, right? There's no, and there certainly is no magic bullet for addressing the problem of race. And I think when we kind of start, I mean, there was no magic bullet in Harlem Hospital when um, Black physicians were trying to integrate. Um, everybody had really good intentions, right? But that did not stop these really epic and vitriolic conflicts and, 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 and interactions from taking place. Like it was not, um, I mean, when, when in the, there is, I mean, uh, I think we could say also sort of a legacy of, um, I mean, there's a history of Black hospitals that has been um, sort of known for, for a while. And, and Vanessa Gamble is one of the um, people who have been, she's a Scott historian who um, actually a lot of my work is in some ways, um, I mean, derivative from what she was doing, right? Where she talks about um, some of the tensions that came up, not just in Harlem, but really in other parts of the country that also um, were struggling to kind of build separate hospitals and debating about what the implications that what implications that had for integration. I think you know uh, one of the things that I mean we talk about dealing with issues of race. You kind of have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Well, I mean, you, or you just have to realize that you're, we're going to be uncomfortable in some of these discussions, and that that's never going to change. I think there's such a fundamental part of what we are talking about. It speaks to our moral um, sensibilities. It speaks to how we understand who we are. You know, what does it rep what does it mean to have a segregated or or even a concordant policy? You know, beyond just whether it's effective or not, does that signify something else? Do black people stop going to um, a place where they know they're only going to get concordant care, um, or do they flock to it? I mean, I think those are and 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 at one point do they flock to it, and at another point do they not? Like the idea that we can sort of pinpoint one black person or the black person who is going to, you know, uh, 
patronize um, these types of medical services and, and, and suggest that that never changes over time is also something that I think, you know, history says, you know, that, you know, that way madness lies, right? Like, these are not sort of simple one-off sort of um, issues. And I think there's a level of, I mean, complexity that we, we can only really hope to sort of understand on some levels. That being said, you know, um, everything simple is false and everything complex is useless. So on some level, we're gonna, we, you know, we have to make decisions about what we are going to do, right? What we think is most important. And then essentially accept the consequences that come with that, right? There are, certainly will be moral um, shortcomings, right? There will be moral consequences, whatever decision we sort of, we make on that. And I think um, one of the things that, you know, at least in looking at this historically, one of the things I have come away with is that we have to get over the idea of being the good guy, right? That so many things, that everything that we do has moral implications that aren't great, you know what I mean? That will raise, you know, raise real questions about our ethical standards. And we can defend them um, as much as we can, but that doesn't mean we are alleviated from the burden that comes with, with dealing with the problem of race. Like there are very, I mean, I don't know if there's a, an answer to this question. I know there's not an answer to this question. And I know there's no easy way to, 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 to remedy it or to address it. And so, I mean, it takes, I mean, when you talk about being humble, I mean, I think it was dealing with these issues, you know, that's, that's what we are doing. Um, that's what we need to do at least, so. I can't help myself though, before we turn back to Q&A, um, you know, you are a historian. So in some ways you have the luxury of complexity. Mm -hmm. If I put you in Dr. Pollock's seat, um, just meet like right now today and you can change your mind 60 seconds from now, but which way would you vote on this matching program? That's, I mean, I think if it was me at this particular moment, I would make it like a shadow program. Like I wouldn't actually say that's what I was doing, but de facto I would do that and, <laughs> and see like what the what the the outcomes were. And if it seemed like it was helping people, right, then I would maybe continue to do it. I would be reluctant to formalize it though, unless I got a real like sense from, I mean, it, that would have to come from so many different directions. I mean, patients would have to say it, administrators would have to say it, you know, con, you know, uh, contributors would have to say it, your political, I mean, depending, obviously there are a lot of different factors in there, but I think, um, you know, if the out, if the goal is improving black health, right, which I think um, is fine. Like if we say that's the goal, then I think you do say, all right, let's see if we can make that work on some level, right? Um, there have been policies that have been adopted in U.S. history. The Hill-Burton Act is one of these 19, uh, in the mid-1940s um, that embraced segregation, but still effectively provided um, increased uh, resources to care for poor um, African-American communities in the South, had meaningful implications, meaningful um, uh, benefits for addressing racial health disparities, okay? So that, you know, you can improve health in a segregated, or there was some evidence that you can improve health even in a segregated system, but it's still segregated, right? Um, and there's still consequences that I think go with that as well. So um, that, that's, I mean, I think that's kind of how I do it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I was doing it, but I would, I would, I would try to see if I could make that work. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Sajay, yeah. any thoughts, sorry, on what Adam said? I just wanted to give you a chance before we go to Q&A. Uh, no, I think that, I, I personally, uh, you know, really value what Adam just said as a response to your question. Um, I, I think that I think that there are lots of different um, uh, bits of backflow or uh, sort of consequences that um, that can come from the optics alone of uh, instituting such a policy or program. Um, so um, being able to sort of uh, eliminate. Those sort of consequences by not being public about it at first and then it sort of create like a pilot program and see how that goes and see what the sort of smartest ways are to uh, sort of expand that type of program uh, it, you know resonates with me uh, quite greatly as a as a strategy so I, I'm largely in line with what Adam just said 
And I wanted to give Adam a chance if you wanted to ask any questions of Lauren or Osaze. Um, we do have a, a lot of audience questions, but I wanted to reserve a moment just in case you wanted to do that, Adam. I, I think I actually have a, a, a couple different questions, but I, I'm also kind of open to bringing the audience back in. Let's, let's go ahead and do that. There are a lot of questions here. So um, Charlotte Harrison has been following the Q&A and I'll turn it over to you, Charlotte, to, to raise one of, one of them to begin. Oh, Adam, I see you. I can just say this, you know, like one of the things, like not all of the comments in the chat are going to the, all the, everybody, all the attendees as well. There is just a, I mean, there is a rich discussion going on in here, folks. Uh, and I, I want to you know, rich. Yeah. yeah um, so I just want to say this is great. Great. Well, we are thrilled. Thank you, Kelsey. And thank you to the audience for the excellent questions that are coming in. So I want to start with Robin Pierce. Here's her question. This may be an acceptable short-term solution, but the more important question is why the outcomes are better in race Concordia situations to the extent that this is true. What seems to be important for long-term uh, addressing is to identify the mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Seems to be an assumption that it's just comfort with people who are of the same race. Is there something else going on that can be addressed so that a long-term solution can be found? I'm so, so glad. So, yeah, go ahead, Osama. Yeah, I, I um, Lauren, uh, please, please take this home. I'll give a first pass, first pass uh, answer. Um, I think to address the first question, um, as as I think was alluded to in the question, that um, the benefit seems to really come from uh, trust um, and comfort. Um, and you know, uh, Lauren and I and Adam have spent a lot of time talking about why that is the case and why that's something that uh, patients find um, valuable. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that for later. And the second part um, on the long term, um, you know, perhaps obviously, perhaps obviously, perhaps uh, non obviously, uh, I think has more to do with uh, systemic racism and the broad, broad impacts of uh, systemic racism on uh, the delivery of care. Um, of course, there's no uh, one easy solution that, you know, you can kind of snap your fingers and suddenly solve systemic racism. Racism uh, is, is, not a, is not a construct that, um, you know, occurred overnight and definitely is not something that will sunset uh, overnight, which is why it makes more sense to think about that in the long term. Um, but in the short term, uh, there's definitely um, a way to, or, or there's definitely something to uh, you know, racial concordance that provides benefit uh, for selected groups of patients. Um, and, and that really is the core of why we wanted to have this conversation. Uh, Lauren, would you like to add to that? I would just underscore, I think, um, as you'll see, I've got three takeaways at the end of this. And this idea that race seems to be proxying something in the literature and we're not quite sure what it's proxying is is one of the big points that i've really come to in conversation with osaze and adam um, when you read the papers carefully you know we know we have racial concordance and we know we have some set of outcomes but we don't really know through what pathway the racial concordance appears to be increasing say hospital mortality and as osaze started to say you know um, the papers give various kind of, they float ideas. Maybe it's about um, trust. Maybe it's about communication. You know, saying maybe it's about trust is a whole black box unto itself about what goes into trust. I'm not sure that's really a mechanism, but maybe it's about communication. Maybe it's about patients' expectations when they walk into the room. If I'm a black patient, I walk into the room and I see a white patient I expect to be discriminated against. But if I'm a black patient and I walk into the room and see a black physician, I don't carry that expectation and therefore I enter the arrangement differently. It could also be kind of an expectation going the other way from provider to patient. And this has not been nailed down in the literature. That is something that I feel quite confident about. And so I think this is something that I'm so glad the question was asked because it really just, um, I think reminds us to be, as Adam said, really humble in how we try and interpret and put this literature into practice. 
um, because we don't really know what's kind of under the hood, if you will, uh, of this racial concordance. And then on the short and long term, I think this is one of the other big ideas that we're still kind of wrestling with is um, certainly I think almost everyone here would agree over the long term, I don't think we would want to see anything like a matching program endure forever. In the long term, what we want is a healthcare system where all patients walk in with equal confidence that no matter what provider is assigned to them or what provider they choose, they receive the same level of care and they respond with the same level of kind of enthusiasm about engaging with that physician. The question is, what's the best way to get there? Do we kind of, or could we, should we use something like a matching program to buy ourselves a little time to get to that place? Because we say, you know, clearly right now from the literature, when a black patient sees a white physician, they're not getting the same level of care. So let's, in some ways, um, buy ourselves some time, improve some health outcomes in the short term, and be doing background work, as you know, Keisha and others have been saying in the chat, um, to reform the system long term and then transition back to kind of a race blind assignment system. Or does that interim measure of creating some kind of racial concordance system have such detrimental optics? It sends such dangerous signals that we think it's not worth the social cost even in the short term. And that's kind of how I see uh, that long short term trade off. And I think I would only add to that. I mean, when, I mean, one of the, when we talk about what sort of the mechanisms are, and we sort of talked a little bit about this before, I mean, one of the suspicions that I have, and I think the incident in that uh, Damon Tweed uh, quote sort of, sort of plays out with this is that, um, I mean, black doctors, I think, get very used to being challenged, right? They get very used to being questioned and they're having their legitimacy and their authority and they're sort of um, undermined in some ways. And I think to be successful, they also have to develop sort of a set of, of shadow skills, um, or maybe they refine their communication skills in a way that um, white practitioners aren't always required to do. And that being said, they may, even when they encounter patients who doubt their abilities, right, who question whether or not, you know, they're being put off on them because they think they're stupid, right? Um, whether they're just you being used to, to handle black patients um, through the, the administrative structure of the hospital. They're able, I mean, Tweedy goes on and he says, you know, he goes through a very sort of like patient process. I mean, a, a, you know, a, a deliberate process with the patient where he goes about sort of earning his trust. And then at the end of it, the patient is very, I mean, he, he, he all but apologizes, you know, he's like, I'm sorry, I, you know, I, that stuff I said before, I don't, you know, I'd be happy to have you as my doctor next time I come. Um, and so I think, you know, that's sort of worthwhile to think about. But, but the other part of this is that we, we, we don't want to, you know, I mean, a lot of times people like to talk about Tuskegee as though it's in the past tense. We like to talk about Henrietta Lacks as though it's in the past tense. We like to talk about J. Marion Sims as though it's in the past tense, as though different forms of um, structural discrimination still don't take place in uh, professional medicine. You know, um, and the dialogue that went on, that has been going on, even about how the COVID vaccine is tested, right? If you don't have research that incorporates um, Black subjects, then there are doubts that people have about whether or not whether or not it's effective, um, whether the medical interventions that um, that are being used are, are going to be effective with Black patients. And I think this concern about being exploited is not something that um, I mean it's not just an image problem. I think with professional medicine, but it is something that um, modern practitioners need to be cognizant of. Right. This is. I mean, in many ways, the doubts that patients have about Black practitioners often correlate with their doubts about professional medicine as a whole. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think those are just, yeah, when we talk about the mechanisms and how this works, I think those are, are certainly, I mean, when we say we're in race being a proxy, sometimes it's the, the doubts about the institution that are being amplified that we see playing out. Thanks, Adam. Great. Thanks for those answers. Um, given the time, I'm going to combine some threads of questions and let the panel choose which ones to pick up on. Awesome. Uh, Thank you. That would be good. So we have a question from Jeff Flyer about 
the adequacy of the evidence base when you're making a decision that's got you know, major trade-offs either way, do you feel the evidence base is there to support a program like this? There's a related question about just the ethics of this is a long-term pipeline question, but as we talk about short-term and long-term uh, approaches to the problem, the question is what about the ethics of making hiring decisions based upon race? And finally, uh, the question of, in the meantime, what's being done to educate the black population on what to look for in a clinician? And uh, you know, could that be a, a way of supporting movement? Uh, you know, relying on the autonomy of the patient to make choices. Those are all great, great questions. Uh, so I, I'm going to cherry pick and start with the first question. Um, you know, uh, it, so so the question was, uh, you know, is there a sufficient evidence base to uh, definitively make a decision one way or another based on you know. Uh, what we have as a society have sort of collected as, as data um, to date. Um, you know, I would, I would counter that with the, the second question that uh, uh, Lauren, Adam and I have bounced on a lot, which is, you know, uh, we, this is, this is a, an era in which we, we very much value evidence-based medicine. Um, but this may be a scenario where um, maybe following the evidence isn't necessarily the way to go. Um, I, I'm not confident that um, any, any amount of evidence um, constructed any particular type of way um, would really be sufficient to um, inform a decision here um, one way or another, um, which, is, which is difficult. And, and we did sort of uh, lead people down a certain path because we put them in the, in the <laughs> position of a, of a fictional character who was, you know, considering the decision based on an evidence base. Um, but who's to say that, you know, an evidence base is really the, the foundation upon which uh, one should be primarily making this decision. So I'll stop there and uh, leave it to Lauren and Adam for additional comments. Yeah, I feel like, um, Jeff's question about is the evidence base sufficient, I think is kind of uh, him cutting to the bottom line, like, okay, so what would you do? And it's a fair question. Um, I, I don't find the evidence base, without a clear understanding of the mechanism, I don't find the evidence base like, so overwhelmingly compelling that it would feel to me negligent not to do it. At the same time, I feel like um, if I were running an organization in this moment, it is important to be saying like, are there new things that we can try? Are there potentially radical steps that things that feel radical um, and feel uncomfortable that we should be willing to try because we've known that we have these health disparities persisting for decades, maybe some would say centuries and they don't seem to be getting better. So just continually kicking the can down the road and saying it's a pipeline problem, it's a pipeline problem doesn't really seem to be a robust enough response. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the like rock in a hard place that I still continue to sit in. Yeah. I think if you said to me like right now you've got to do something, you're in the manager's seat, what would you do? I think I would probably first talk um, a lot, maybe survey staff about what they would think about such a program since they're a key piece and you need some sufficient number to kind of opt in in order for this to even be a meaningful quote unquote, unquote program. And then if I were to do it, I think I would be very clear with myself and with patients that this was a time bound effort. So we're going to try this for six months, or we're going to try this for one year. And then kind of hold your feet to the fire that at the one year mark, our hope is that we no longer need to do any kind of matching, because you will be able to walk into this organization and be confident that no matter what physician you're matched with, you're going to receive the same kind of care. Um, and if you have to re-up the program, you re-up it at one year, right? You try it for one year, maybe the outcomes still aren't the same, so you do it for another year. But really force yourself as a management team to continually revisit this um, and always keep in mind that this is not a permanent solution and therefore the policy should not appear on the books as if it's a permanent solution. It is always an interim and an effort to tide you over to kind of a better world. I think, 
one of the questions, and I, I, I maybe started to allude to this a little bit earlier, right? One of the questions that I wonder if we don't need to consider a little, I mean, carefully as we talk about, you know, I mean, even when we talk about this in sort of the notion of the pipeline, um, you know, if we are begin to adopt these programs, are they only programs, are they only, would they only be adopted when we are dealing with, for example, general practitioners or um, in, in specialties that had a, a relatively um, lower level of status within the medical profession, right? Um, and part of the reason that sort of signifies to me is because that's also the same role that Abraham Flexner ascribed to black physicians in the early part of the 20th century, right? When he initiated this major um, set of reforms that really implemented the, the standards that we, many of the standards that we use today to, to train medical practitioners, right? The idea was that black doctors would be um, created just to serve black patients, right? And he said, we can have now 80% of the hospitals that were directed toward, um, that were black hospitals closed as a resu result of the reforms that Flexner um, and the AMA and uh, the Carnegie Foundation initiated, right? And the, the words that he used was that these, they would effectively, I mean, he didn't put them this way, but um, they've been looked at, he, he assigned a place where they would be effectively glorified sanitarians, right? Um, the question that I have, like the, the, the things that inhibit the pipeline growth, right, um, are still very much in place in um, the medical profession. And, and a lot of those are, are very much educational. Um, integrating hospitals in the 1960s did not expand the number of black practitioners in the field, right? It was 2% in 1968, it was 2%, I think in 1998, I think it's maybe 6% today around that, right? Six or 7%. Um, there is a lot of critical soul searching that we would really need to do to say like, if we are going to bring more black practitioners, black doctors in to serve in professional medicine, some of the fundamental notions that we have surrounding ideas like merit and good medicine would have to be interrogated much more thoroughly than I think we are generally comfortable doing, right? But that being said, I mean, if it is about outcomes, right, then there may also be, you know, room for elevating the role of the nurse practitioner in this, right, where we might say, you know, if we, we don't necessarily have to speak only about, um, you know, uh, trained MDs, but what about sort of elevating um, the allied professions in ways that would also be more likely, that, that, that don't require as much of an investment of time and effort um, and money and resources to actually complete, but would perhaps allow us uh, a means to bring more black practitioners into the practice of medicine. And while they might not be certified MDs, they might very well be capable of providing the type of intervention, interventions and care that um, would, would stand to improve black health. Thank you, panel. Thank you, each of you. And I think that although this, we've reached the point where we have to turn to the next part of the program. I want to just share a point made in one of the questions that I imagine the panel would endorse what want to comment on if we had more time, which is that while it's important to focus on the clinician relationship and the specific uh, example that's given here, this doesn't address uh, biases across the institution, the infrastructure, the policies and so forth, the climate of an institution that could affect the way care is delivered by all practitioners. And that is just a topic that needs further discussion. And if I can just amplify that a little bit, you know, if we are talking about money, nobody ever says, well, they had an intention to, to make some money, right? The business failed, but they had good intentions. But when we talk about race, all we talk about is intentions, right? They had good intentions instead of talking about outcomes. And so I think when we, when we talk about the institutional inhibitions, right, the way that structural forms of discrimination continue to operate within the medical profession, it's not because there's some explicit um, policy that says black people can't do this or black people have to do this. It's because there are these larger structural systems that inhibit um, black health, but also inhibit um, the, 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 the careers of, of black practitioners in many ways. 
So I want to make sure that we um, that we get a chance to thank all, all of our panelists. But first, um, just spend a few minutes, if if you'd like, the three of you to to kind of bring us home. If you had any concluding thoughts or points that you wanted to make um, before we thank you for the day. Well, Kelsey, we are hoping to re-poll quickly and see if folks could give us a, a pulse check. Osaze, do you want to say a little more? Uh, yeah, uh, Ashley, if you wouldn't mind uh, bringing up the poll again. Um, you know, now that we've had this extremely rich conversation, um, you know, the audio, the audio of which, you know, um, only only captures the tip of the iceberg, to be completely honest. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we want to know, you know, again, same situation, if you were Dr. Pollock, would you support the implementation of a race-based uh, physician-patient matching system? Uh, the responses are already uh, fascinating. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll give people, a, a, you know, a few more moments to, uh, to, to consider, um, you know, between a rock and a hard place, choosing yes or no. Uh, yes, I know it's not exactly a fair way to phrase the question, um, but I suppose that's sort of the point. Um, the, the purpose isn't really the, the final decision, more so the, the, the thought process and the considerations. I'm gonna ask also, if you're someone who changed their mind, meaning you were yes and you became no or vice versa, and you'd be willing to tell us just like 30 seconds of why, raise your hand, because I would love to hear what arguments seem to sway folks. All right, we've got, yes, still wins the day, carries the day, but it's a Just much barely. closer poll. Yeah. Um, does anyone wanna share just 30 seconds if you changed your mind? Or if you didn't change your mind, we could hear that too. No hands. It, it does seem, uh, it looks like we have one uh, raised hand, perhaps. Oh. Uh, it, it does seem that on the whole, uh, there there is a, a bit of a trend toward uh, more, uh, I don't want to call it ambivalence, just uncertainty about whether or not <laughs> implementation of this type of system would be uh, good on the whole. Yeah. Beverly, I just allowed you to talk. Would you tell us just briefly your thoughts? Yes, I, I still had, as I stated, the first initial reservation about the reverse racism being a concern, but more importantly, as Dr. Harrison mentioned at the beginning, the implicit and the explicit bias, it's difficult as a physician to understand how just one or two courses at the near end of someone's training would sway heavily against the bias that has been inculcated into them during a lifetime. And I think a more effective means would be really understanding you pretty much learn most of the things you need to know by five years of age, mm -hmm. but definitely through your primary and secondary years of education, more needs to be done to make persons less race conscious than they are presently encountering in school so that by the time decisions are made to enter medicine, they already have a healthier mindset toward those who look different than themselves. And so I think that needs to be a part of the larger conversation in addition to making it possible for persons to choose people if they choose to do so that look like them to provide their care. Thanks Beverly. Uh, I'm not seeing any other hands. So I'm gonna take the moment just uh, to share a couple of final kind of, I hesitate to call them takeaways because they, Discussion of, points, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so I jump in here, but yeah, I called them takeaway challenges. You could see my ambivalence already. I just wanted to highlight three. One is something I mentioned before, but I think in the spirit of being epistemically humble in the face of this question, what do we do with this literature? I think just staying clear about the fact that we're not really sure what racial concordance is telling us, like what what the mechanism is. We know that the race of the physician is serving as a proxy for something, or I should say we think that it's serving as a proxy for something. Um, and I think uh, managing by proxy measure is always risky because you risk losing sight of the true outcome. 
here, um, I think it's especially risky because managing by proxy, meaning setting up a racial matching program has some potentially substantive social costs as well. But I just wanted to leave you with this idea of a proxy and what is it proxying and kind of an appetite to continue to ask further questions and maybe yourself contribute to this literature about what's really under the hood of racial concordance. The second point is um, just that I think we need to be careful and again humble when we think about being evidence-based managers. It's very tempting because there's so much fanfare and enthusiasm it seems for evidence-based management to let that drift into the practice of management and say, I'm an evidence-based manager, as if that absolves you of some kind of agency in making inevitably morally loaded choices. And I think um, that's somewhat dangerous because as we've seen, what would it even mean to be an evidence-based manager in the face of this literature? It's not necessarily clear and it's not as if um, looking at this evidence absolves you of the agency and making the tough moral calls. I'd also just call forward one comment. Um, Vinay Prasad has, has spent a lot of time thinking about this racial concordance literature and he kind of cautions um, his listeners on a podcast uh, to really be careful about saying that good things need an evidence base in order to do them. And what he means by that in relation to this issue of racial concordance is it can be enough to just say, look, um, the diversity of the physician workforce is a good unto itself. It is important to do for a whole host of reasons. We do not need to necessarily link the import of the diversity of the physician workforce to some kind of patient outcome in order to make that case. And when we cede kind of the moral argument to an empirical one and make it seem as if, well, it's only important to care about the diversity of the physician workforce if we can show 19% in hospital mortality reduction, then we've really potentially lost something. We've certainly maybe lost ground in the argument. And so I just wanted to raise that up. And then finally, this last point has been coming through in people's discussion about short and long-term outcomes. But one thing Osaze and I have really been wrestling with is this idea of there's contingency in how we pursue social change. And because we're talking uh, during Martin Luther King Jr. week, um, I thought it would be appropriate to bring this forward from his, where do we go from here? He said, the white liberal must affirm that absolute justice for the Negro simply means in the Aristotelian sense that the Negro must have his due. It is, however, important to understand that giving a man his due may often mean giving him special treatment. And I think this really captures um, both a deep kind of insight and discomfort that we all share about this conversation, but also the kind of managerial complexity. In an organizational ethics consortium, we should recognize that you can read this and say, yeah, man, that's true. But then it's left to the manager to decide the circumstances under which special treatment are warranted and what the design of that quote unquote special treatment is that will further the goal of what he calls absolute justice. Or if I can borrow a term from my friend, Matthew Riley, who's on the line, uh, who is himself a King enthusiast, you know, what will further the goals um, of pursuing beloved community? So I just wanted to frame those up as takeaways. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Kelsey. Thanks. Adam, let me invite you. I know you wanted to make a final comment if, if you wanted to jump in. Oh, the only thing I have to say is just, I really appreciate you guys um, including me in this discussion. Um, and I mean, I, I can't see the audience folks, but you know, I really appreciate the, the level of engagement that um, you all have, have, have taken part in this as well. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm just glad to see that folks are interested and invested in, in, in exploring this topic more. Um, I appreciate you all yeah, um, inviting me to be a part of it. Thank you so much. Um, I think the overall comment that we can really make here from the perspective of what the Organizational Ethics Consortium has committed itself to is just to thank the three of you um, for really kind of modeling for us what a learning community can look like and inviting everyone in to grapple with what is a difficult issue and to think carefully about not just health as a consideration, but how do we find ways to encounter one another in relationships um, that are equal and that are less inhibited by some of the harmful distinctions that we have um, allowed to shape our reality um, for far too long. So 
I uh, just wanted to thank each one of you and also to the audience for um, being so engaged. Uh, our website shows upcoming programming. We're gonna transition to thinking a little bit about supply challenges during COVID-19 for organizations um, and some ethics consults around that in our coming program in February. Um, and we just encourage you to, to join us and want to extend my deepest thanks to all of you, to my co-chairs, Jim and Charlotte. Um, and thank you so much. Be well and good afternoon. Thanks everybody. Thank you.